All right, guys, we're going to continue. Uh, Dr. Lancaster is going to teach us a little bit about perioperative nutrition. Okay, I have no relevant disclosures, uh, except that I went on the Boost website doing research and they offered me a 20% coupon code. So I have no Boost. Um, it's also worth mentioning that I'm not a registered dietitian, obviously, and this is not an exhaustive review. Nutrition is a huge, uh, super complex topic. And my goal is to just give you some quick thought and hopefully bring some awareness to something that I think that we should be thinking more about. I'm going to focus specifically on malnutrition in the perioperative period. It's an increasingly popular topic in the literature across all of our subspecialties. One of the reasons that this is so popular is that nutrition has been identified as a modifiable risk factor for perioperative outcomes. So we want to know if we can push patients to do better by addressing their nutritional status. So as an outline, we'll go through some definitions that matter, the surgical cascade, surrogates for malnutrition, why I think we should care about this, some possible interventions and conclusions. So broadly speaking, malnutrition is an imbalance of nutrients. It can describe under and over nutrition and issues with both macro and micronutrients. It can also be described in relation to its causes, so related to starvation, chronic disease, or acute injury states. I'm going to focus on malnutrition as it relates to the stresses of surgery with a heavy focus on general protein undernutrition and a lack of sufficient post-operative calorie intake. Lots of factors can increase the risk of this imbalance, including obesity, low BMI, malnutrition states, including gastric bypass, and age, as it's most common in patients age 60 to 70. Another important concept is that of sarcopenia or age-related muscle wasting. This is a natural part of aging, but can also be exacerbated by chronic disease or nutritional issues. Obese patients can also experience this with high levels of adipose tissue, but very low levels of lean muscle mass. And so many of our patients are older and they start at a disadvantage due to this age-related muscle loss. So you may think as residents we're already experts on malnutrition via personal experience, uh, but it's not something that we talk about that much. Or, compared to other modifiable risk factors with much more research like smoking or high BMI. And so malnutrition is a difficult thing to study, which is part of the problem, and there's many confounders. One of the issues is there is no perfect surrogate measurement to show us if patients are malnourished or if they're responding to our interventions. Albumin is the most widely used marker, um, but it is controversial, which I'll discuss more in a moment. Total lymphocyte count is also used, but some believe it to be a poor marker, and so it's usually discussed in relation to other markers. Transferrin has also come up, but has mixed reviews in the literature and is once again reported in some studies alongside albumin. Of note, pre-albumin is not commonly used as the range for normal varies quite a bit and there's no official definition in orthopedics for nutritional status based on pre-albumin alone. Anthropometric measurements have also been described, but these are somewhat cumbersome and are difficult to interpret in obese patients. A variety of screening tools also exist, the best of which combine objective data such as BMI and weight loss with more subjective information about diet and lifestyle. This is an example of one of the better assessment tools, the mini nutritional assessment, uh, which was designed to be rapidly performed and easy to use. It has been correlated with prognostic factors, especially in elderly patients, and looks at body measurements, diet, recent weight changes, and psychologic factors. Albumin is fundamental to this discussion, and so I think it's worth discussing a little bit more, especially given some of the issues with it. It's the most abundant protein in our plasma, making up 60% of our total serum proteins, and it serves a lot of important physiologic functions. The normal range is 3.5 to 5, and it's synthesized entirely in the liver with a half of 20 days. 
The plasma concentrations are a result of synthesis, degradation, and distribution. There's factors at play beyond how much the liver is actually producing. The catabolic states and fluid shifts can change the concentration without any changes in production. Albumin is believed to be a reliable marker of overall nutrition in non-acutely ill patients, but it's not specific, which is the problem. Low levels can be caused by lots of things that are sure few patients face, like blood loss, fluid overload, inflammation, trauma, and infection. So albumin is a negative acute phase protein, meaning that its concentrations decrease in response to inflammation. So it begs the question, is low albumin a cause or correlate of poor outcomes? And we don't fully understand this or know the answer. But despite these controversies and issues with albumin, it remains the most widely used marker in our literature. So as you grapple with your new trust issues about albumin, um, I want to transition by reminding you that all, not all malnourished patients look the same, and they don't all meet our stereotypes. It's not uncommon for obese and diabetic patients to be malnourished as they consume foods that are high in calories but low in nutritional value. Some studies have found that obese, malnourished patients are at especially increased risk for complications, more than their counterparts who just have one of those risk factors. So why should we care? So there's huge nutritional demands around this time of surgery. And our data would suggest that a lot of our patients, especially our older patients, go into the stressful time already behind the curve. Our literature quotes anywhere from four to 50% of pre-op patients have labs suggestive of malnutrition. And our data suggests that a low albumin affects many outcomes that we care about, and it's likely a modifiable risk factor. We'll start with some background physiology. The stress response of surgery um, initiates a number of things in the body. The first is an elevation of catabolic hormones that gives you an insulin resistant hyperglycemic state. The next is an increase in gluconeogenesis to help fuel this response, and amino acids act as an important precursor to the process. Then there's an upregulation of stress hormones and pro-inflammatory cytokines. This triggers catabolism of glycogen, once again to meet demands of wound healing, and a reduction in protein synthesis and an increase in breakdown to fuel these processes. This all results in a net efflux of amino acids from the skeletal muscle to provide precursors for wound healing, immune function, and also to go back into the gluconeogenesis cycle. All of this leads to muscle catabolism from the stress response. And this plus immobilization after surgery can lead to significant skeletal muscle loss. In total, we have a hyperbolic, catabolic, hypermetabolic catabolic state following surgery. This stress response can last anywhere from a few hours after surgery to days to weeks. And muscle loss happens as early as 48 hours with significant losses by five days. The important takeaway here is that the stress response happens in normal, healthy patients and is exacerbated in patients that have protein malnutrition or sarcopenia as they already have reduced muscle mass and protein stores to start with. Multiple parts of this cascade lead to an increased risk of infection, including the hyperglycemic state and the lack of amino acids needed for appropriate immune function. It's also worth mentioning that we exacerbate this process further by asking patients to fast much before their surgery time, and this depletes their glycogen stores way before they ever enter the operating room. And so back to why we should care and the outcomes. I don't have time in this talk to do an exhaustive review of all of the literature, so you'll have to take my word for it that I read a lot of papers about this. But as with any research, some are good, some are bad, but there are plenty that are reasonable and do a good job looking at this, from large database studies to single surgeon series. And they generally all point to the same thing, which is that patients with low albumin do worse. In the literature, patients with low albumin were shown to have all of the poor outcomes here listed. And based on what we know about the imperfect nature of surrogates, it certainly makes sense to question if low albumin is just a marker for sick patients that we would expect to do worse anyways. But these results remain significant even when their comorbidities were controlled for. And so we know from pathophysiology that protein is really important for sustaining a stress response after surgery, and albumin is one of our most uh, abundant protein markers. And so there's likely something to this beyond just a hidden marker for sick patients. The other reason that we should care about this is it's likely making our most vulnerable patients more vulnerable. And so 10% of American households are food insecure, and these rates are higher in Hispanics and African Americans, higher in women, higher in poor patients, and higher in rural patients with the very highest rates seen in our Native American rural patients. And so many of our patients live in food deserts or food swamps where there's access, where there's very poor access to healthy food or enough food. And this means the highest burden of insecurities on these already marginalized people. 
Um, and so we need to be thoughtful about making sure we provide the best care to people who already have a lot of risk. The other reason that we should care is that patients ask about this and they, in different ways all the time. These are all things patients have asked me just in the last month that kind of relate to nutrition. And so I wanna make sure I have a good answer for them and what to tell them when they ask. And so what can we do? <laughs> uh, so the obvious question is, should we be patients screening patients preoperatively? And there's no consensus about this. It's unlikely to be cost effective in all comers uh, due to kind of a low prevalence in normal people and a lack of a gold standard test. And the best advice is that patient history and clinical judgment should determine whether we need to address someone's nutritional status further. So trust your gut, not super helpful. Um, but when screening is needed, there, a short tool like the mini nutritional assessment that I mentioned is better than just lab screening alone. because It gets a sense of some of their other factors, including diet and recent weight loss. So if you're on the resident cake and champagne diet, you might want to dig a little further into their nutritional status. <laughs> Um, the next question is about pre-op supplementation. There's little data in the orthopedic literature about this also, and no consensus on an optimal approach. That being said, studies in non-orthopedic fields, which have looked at this much more extensively, have shown reduced post-op complications with 10 days to two weeks of oral supplements. And this includes meta-analyses of randomized control trials and other really strong research in GI surgery field, uh, including others. The European Nutrition Society guidelines recommend 10 to 14 days of pre-op oral supplements for patients with severe risk factors. And so these are patients who have lost a lot of weight recently, very low albumin, BMI under 18.5, or a subjective global assessment grade of C, which is another screening tool. And so if you have an at-risk patient, consider sending them to a registered dietitian for additional evaluation after or before elective surgery. So even in normal preoperative patients, we should probably be highlighting the importance of proper nutrition leading up to surgery more. So we can coach them that their surgery is like an athletic event, and they should be fueling up before their surgery with a balanced diet and high-quality proteins and eating enough protein to offset the catabolic consequences of surgery. And so this gets us to the topic of post-op supplementation. There are a few smaller studies out there that show that elderly patients with hip fractures or hip replacements do better with extra calories and or protein in the post-operative time period. But there's one study that really stood out as being pretty convincing, and so I'm going to go through that one in a little bit more depth. This is a study out of Sweden. Um, it's a prospective RCT with 80 healthy patients, and they looked at patients who were over 60 who had a uh, hip fracture that was fixed with arthroplasty or fixation. And so their goal is to see if nutritional supplementation decreased fracture-related complications after surgery. Because they've been previously published that hip fracture patients start with protein malnutrition at very high rates and have very poor energy intake post ops And so in the control group, they just had them eat normal hospital food, whatever they felt like eating. In the intervention group, on post ops day one to three, where they worried that patients would not be able to take in enough orally, they used an IV supplement that gave them 1,000 extra calories a day. Um, and then on post ops post op day four to 10, um, they did an oral supplement that gave them 400 calories, um, equal ratio of protein and carbs. And so in total, they got 6,000 extra calories in the first 10 days after surgery. And they kept these patients for a long time um, in this European hospital. And so they calculated all their meals, calories, and fluids and recorded everything, which is very labor intensive. And they recorded all their outcomes out to four months. And so these are, this is just a summary of the most important findings, but the patients in the control group, the first three days after surgery, sure were only eating 665 calories on average. I'm pretty sure my dog eats more than that every day. And so those numbers are abysmal. And so an in intervention group, you know, they had much higher calorie intake with the IV supplements as you'd expect. And then even once they got out further from surgery and on an average from the first 10 days, the control group was only eating 900 calories. So that's 50% of optimal values. The intervention group did better at about 1,300 calories. That's still only 85% of optimal. Um, but I think the biggest part of the study is that when they looked at their overall complications at 120 days, the intervention group did substantially better, 15% total complications compared to 70% in the control group. And so this table breaks down the complications into a little bit more detail. It should be noted that the groups were similar, except for the intervention group on average was six years older than the control group, but they still did significantly better. And so these are healthy patients in a prospective control trial. 
who did significantly better with more calories and more protein after surgery in regards to infection, mortality, and all of their complications. So even though we don't understand a lot about this topic still, and the research is difficult to perform, it seems like a good argument for increased nutritional support for a lot of our patients. The next thing we can do is educate patients. And so the recommended amounts of protein are somewhere between 1.6 and 3 grams per kilogram per day consumed in 20 to 40 gram sittings to improve um, absorption. And so appetite can be reduced following surgery. This is where protein supplements, things like boost come into play. And once again, I think we can talk to our patients like surgery is like an athletic endeavor. It's so is your physical therapy. And so we should be timing nutrition around PT. So patients eat a couple hours before and then drink their protein boost after they work out. So you gotta tell Nana, you're just like an athlete, you gotta get up there and then you gotta drink your boost. <laughs> so this is what the rec recommendation actually looks like. Um, and it's pretty overwhelming. So this is for a 70 kilogram patient. Many of our patients are obviously much heavier than that. And this is what two grams per kilogram per day would look like broken up into the um, suggested amounts per sitting. So that's a lot of protein. Um, and that's a lot of high quality protein and foods that they're not necessarily getting in the hospital. Uh, I've never seen avocado here, but I, <laughs> and so, you know, we hear patients all the time, like, oh, how are you eating? Well, the food's not very good here. And you can, you can quickly imagine how they're eating that 650 calories a day if they just pick in a couple meals a day and that's all they eat. Um, and so some, some studies have shown that patients probably only 30% of the cal of the protein they actually need following surgery. So quickly, this is a study that looked at 1,000 elective total joints patients in a number of facilities. They created a three-point program. And so in the beginning, they just taught patients about a high-protein anti-inflammation diet at a mandatory pre-op meeting, kind of like our Joint Academy. And then they looked at their pre-op albumin labs. And those patients who had an albumin suggestive malnutrition, they just called them and told them, hey, you're malnourished, we really need you to follow this diet. And then the malnourished patients were seen inpatient by a dietitian who just reinforced the importance of a diet, um, of an appropriate diet, and then sent them home with some post-operative education materials. They didn't actually supplement them in-house any different in the groups. And they found that the patients that were educated about an important diet had shorter length of stay, lower cost, and lower readmission rates. And patients who were flagged as malnourished but then received the education compared to the control groups. And so I think this suggests that education about diet could be effective and improve outcomes even without aggressive expensive interventions. And so we know that we don't have a lot of extra time in our clinics to do this kind of counseling with every patient. And we should be making sure that patients who are at risk get the kind of nutritional support they need in a way that's easy and streamlined. And so there are already a number of wellness programs at the U, uh, but it sounds like they can be somewhat confusing for providers. And so some ortho programs, including ours, have started to expand into the field of lifestyle medicine, which takes a holistic approach to patient care and tries to address nutrition along with sleep, mental health, and physical activity, among other things. Uh, currently, Dr. English, who helped me with this talk, and I appreciate her assistance, um, sees select pre-op patients for lifestyle medicine consults. And this is um, something that goes along with this lifestyle nutrition, and so this can be a useful tool for preoperative patients if you have someone you're worried about. Um, she's also planning to talk to us further in January at another grand rounds about doing group pre-op therapy, um, addressing some of these issues with some of our elective surgery patients. So I think that's an interesting thing that's coming down the pipe. Um, there are a few registered dietitians that commonly work with our ortho patients, and it sounds like the UOC might be in the process of hiring a dedicated person just to always be at the UOC, which would be helpful to have someone that's readily available. Um, and some of the literature suggests that having a registered dietitian in your clinic should be standard of care. I think we're a long way from that, but kind of highlighting the importance of uh, how much some people think this matters who have studied it. And so for our hospitalized patients, there are a number of registered dietitians available in most of the units, and they can see our patients if we need them to. Um, on some services like trauma, it's automatic that the dietitian sees the patients, but on other services, you have to ask. And so we can be adding boosts and things like that on our own, but if there's people you're worried about or if you've had a big surgery, it's worth talking to the dietitian. Um, it would probably be a good QI project in the future for somebody if you wanted to look at all the resources that were available and synthesize them into some kind of guide that uh, providers can more easily access um, and use, but I didn't do that, so.
Um, so in conclusion, malnutrition is common in our surgical patients and it's associated with poor outcomes. Surrogates are imperfect, especially in the acute setting, but patients with nutritional support obviously do better in the studies that exist. And so this appears to be a modifiable risk factor, and we should work to educate patients on the importance of this uh, before and after surgery, or refer to a dietitian when they're needed. Nutrition research is really hard, and so we need further studies to optimize screening and supplement protocols to make this easier to give to our patients. And if you want more proof, it's probably in the pudding. And I'd be welcome to, or happy to share my code with you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Any idea of how much uh, preterial nutrition costs? And if we started doing this in factory patients or little joints, would we overwhelm the system? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I couldn't find any data about the cost of like the IV nutrition. Um, I expect it is pretty expensive. Um, but they didn't report any of the studies that I saw. I think the boost is pretty cheap. So I don't think that that would be a big deal um, to be giving more of our post-operative patients. But I'd have to ask one of the dietitians for the exact cost. What is the source of the I think it's way. Yeah, from the reading I did, whey is the most um, well tolerated and effective of the animal protein sources, and then soy is the best of the non animal protein sources, although not quite as good as whey. And so I'm pretty sure Boost is whey based. A soy version. There's a shocking amount of options on the Boost website. <laughs> Um, and so they do have some that are, yeah. and so they have some that are like low sugar for diabetic patients because obviously you don't want to be, you know, creating another problem. And so there are a lot of options. Um, so I assume there's a lactose intolerant option. Well, I think there's some decent data in the general surgery literature about like preoperative like fasting and its effects on like negative effects on outcomes. I think it's hard for like trauma fracture patients because we don't know when they're going to go. But like, is there any data out there on like elective cases with like joints where maybe the blood, you know, if they're going to be an afternoon case, or other people like trying to optimize like same day nutrition? Yeah, so there actually there's a, a good paper I can send you, but. Um... The thought is that if you have patients fast for a long time, you've gotten their glycogen stores quite a bit depleted before surgery. And so there are advocates out there that are saying we should be giving patients carb-rich drinks two hours before surgery. Um, and then they should be getting quite a bit more calories, like in the six to eight hours, you know, right before they can become actually MPO. And so keeping patients MPO after midnight and doing their surgery at four the next day is definitely not from a nutritional standpoint, ideal. It's obviously really difficult, but you know, it's it's kind of back to the idea of thinking like an athletic endeavor is that people should be fueling like all the way up until the time of surgery um, as much as they can without affecting anesthesia, obviously. Um, so that so the, it's more like the carb-rich drinks right before it has been looked at. There's a Corey Collins paper uh, that said that you know you can to control patient on admission. Well, I go out anemic, but that after 24 hours in a PDL, there's a much greater percentage. So you can either believe that that makes you malnourished, or you can believe that albumin isn't a very good test. You can also be sure. You can do that quickly. It's really indicating you're malnourished. The answer for that is no, because it is the fluid shifts and the catabolic response shifts albumin into the extravascular space and changes the amounts much more than synthesis does. Um, but they have shown that so during surgery, your albumin synthesis decreases and immediately after it starts to creep back up. But if you support people in that immediately after phase, the amount that it creeps back up can be improved. Okay.